Welcome back, everyone. Uh, we hope you all had a great holiday and look forward to an exciting fall season with a lot of hardware hacking. In the last months, we've been working really hard on delivering a physical and safe edition of Hardware IO Netherlands. Um, our full training lineup is already announced on our website. And next week, we'll also reveal our speakers for the Netherlands edition. Um, with today's session, we will restart our weekly webinars. I'm glad to welcome today Maggie and Kuau, who are both security researchers at Intel. In the past, Maggie uh, was part of Hardware I.O. USA 2019. Um, and today they will be presenting PCIe device security, the evolution of DMA attacks. Before we start the webinar, I would like to just do a little housekeeping. The presentation as, usually will, uh, as usual will take 30 minutes followed by a 10 minute Q&A. And if you have any questions, please share them across um, the chat box and we will answer them after the presentation is over. Um, we will also record the session and the webinar will be available later on our YouTube channel. And without further ado, I would like to invite you, Maggie, to start your presentation uh, with Kuau. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so thank you so much for having us. Today, we're gonna to talk to you about PCIe device security and the evolution of DMA attacks. My name is Maggie Kaudegi. I'm a security researcher for Intel and I work for a team called PSG or Programmable Solutions Group. Uh, my name is Cuauhtémoc Chavez Corona. Uh, I am security researcher also at Intel for almost nine years now. And I work for the Data Platform Group uh, focusing on server platforms. Thank you so much for joining me, Quo. And today we're gonna to talk about how PCI protocol is really one of those protocols that stood the test of time as being one of the most commonly used protocols in the industry. We have PCI devices found today in a wide variety of platforms from small IoT devices to massive supercomputers that can take advantage of the speed and the versatility the protocol provides. Um, we're going to talk about one of its most interesting and powerful features, DMA, or direct memory access, that it also brings some potentially interesting uh, security concerns. Uh, we're going to talk about those atta DMA attacks, about some of the D DMA security features that have evolved throughout the years, some of the benefits that those bring, some of the challenges of those features, and what we can do, the best practices, so that we can ensure that the that our features are working correctly and giving us the most protection um, as, as intended. And we're also gonna to talk to you about some of the upcoming technology that has some interesting enhancements to protect from some of these types of vulnerabilities in the future. So just to set ourselves in the, in the frame of the technology, we can uh, make a little introduction about what is the, the PCI protocol. And, Actually, as Maggie mentioned, this is a, a almost 30 years old idea now, a protocol that was implemented by researchers and, well, was, was created by researchers and Intel and implemented at uh, IBM. And basically, and but this, this protocol has gone through a lot of evolutions. Now, today we have the PCA Express that is architecturally a little different, but it has some of the same ideas that the original protocol. We are almost, well, we are uh, almost on the sixth generation with a, 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 a speed of oh, 8.0 giga, giga, gigabytes of, of transfer per lane, right? This protocol is being used to connect all kinds of devices today, as, as already was mentioned, not only external devices, but something that we need to consider is that also in several architecturals, the internal components are also mapped as PCI devices. This all this to make a more homogeneous management of the of, of the components, uh, allowing the the software be more simple when it access uh, hardware resources. Uh, the 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 one one of the one of the main features of the of the PCI Express. 
uh, the, the PCI Express uh, protocol is that this is a point uh, point to point uh, protocol that is divided in several layers, mainly the transactions, the data, and the physical layers. Each one uh, uh, each one's focused on deliver the, the transaction in an efficient way. And basically through this protocol, we have three types of transactions that are being for interest today. There are many more, but this one shows the, what is the main functionality of the transaction or the main functionality that we can have with PCI. That is the, the IO read, IO write, the ones that allow us, allow us to access to the IO space in the, in, in the, in, in the, in the SOC. One of the most known, known is the config read and config write, or the, the ones that allow us to perform access to the config space of the, of the PCI devices. I mentioned it, not only, not only PCI devices have access, not only PCI, devi PCI devices, external PCI devices have config space, also internal IPs have config space and config registers, what makes this one a very, a very powerful capability. And finally, we have the memory, the memory access, right? The direct memory access that translated as the memory read and memory write transactions, which allow us to, depending on the architecture, get, grab data directly from the talking directly to the to the memory controller and grab data data or set data directly into the memory without any knowledge of the CPU. So the next one. So uh, talking about direct access to the memory, we have the DMA feature. Uh, this is a very powerful feature that is implemented. It's not only implemented in the PCI device, in the PCI, in the PCI devices, but it's uh, because of how well extended the protocol is today and how is you being used uh, this capability, this, they are almost are uh, tied together across the industry. So basically the direct memory access is, as, as I mentioned it, the device accessing the system memory without any intervention of the main CPU. This allows you to the main CPU to reduce dramatically the overhead because it doesn't have to be worried about uh, being moving data around and can focus on other more critical, uh, other more critical operations. So uh, basically how the, the, the transaction, when the, a proper implemented a pro and correctly functioning uh, DMA transactions will work is that the CPU uh, sent a handshake or a descriptor to a DMA controller that could be inside of the SOC or outside in an external, in an, in an external uh, in a, a PC DMA compatible card. And then this descriptor will say for what is the amount of memory that will be moved and the origin and the destiny, right? So then uh, one that the CPU send the descriptor uh, and makes the handshake, the, the CPU gets free. And now it's a task of the DMA to move all that data around from the, from the, perif from the peripheral or the external device to the memory or other or <clears throat> Or otherwise, right? So we have uh, this. This will dramatically increase the performance. Uh, but uh, however, uh, this will dramatically in increase the performance, and the CPU will respond when the the the, the, the CPU will be notified when the the, the transaction will be completed uh, through an interruption that is being done by the DMI controller. And then the CPU could continue uh, working with the data that has been moved. Uh, as mentioned, it, and other protocols like Thunderbolt and USB for uh, 4.0 are they are also support DMA, uh, depending of the actual architecture of the SLC. But the PCI Express is one of the more extended in the in the industry today that is being used in client uh, client platforms, server platforms, etc. Right. And the next one. Now, uh, once that we have, uh, that we understand what is the direct memory access, always we need to think about how this can be used in a malicious way to uh, bypass the protections that are implemented in the architecture. And that is why we have what is, what is called the DMA attack. As we mentioned it, the, 
the feature allow us to access the the memory without the any without any intervention in any intervention of the of the CPU, right? But that allows us to the, that by default allows to the could allow to the device to access sensitive data into the into the memory without any low knowledge of the of the CPU. Uh, and as mentioned in the past, uh, how the when the when the CPU wants to access want to wants to exercise the DMA feature, well they can do this gen, gentleman agreement to send a descriptor and then move the perform the transactions and move the memory the data around. However, by definition, there's nothing that is allowed the PCI card to try to start to send memory read and memory write transactions once that the the port is enabled, even without any notice of the of the SOC. So that is what makes this kind of attack especially dangerous, and especially one that we need to uh, pay attention on the uh, when the, when we are building one architecture for client or data center or data center, or even when we are uh, working with the with with with, with the personal devices, right? So. Also, one thing that we need to remember is that most of the memory protections or the memory uh, isolation technologies that were implemented in the in the CPU, they don't they don't ex they didn't exist at the beginning in the in the SOAD complex or the input output controller that was in charge to manage the, all the transactions that were coming from the DMA engines. That is where this opened a big hole at the, in the like when the, the technology was implemented at the, at the beginning that has been fixed across the across the years to try to limit the power and the access that the DMA transactions could have. And another thing that I would like to mention because I have seen around in different uh, different articles and different guidelines in, inter, uh, in in the web that if you limit the access to to the cards that are plugged in your uh, in your system, that will mitigate definitively the 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 possibility the any possible DMA attack that could, that you could have because uh, there there's the idea that a DMA attack is a pure, uh, a purely uh, physical kind of uh, kind of attack. However, that's not true, especially today when we have more and more devices with PCI, PCI compatible devices with DMA capabilities than are uh, every time they are more complex. So those, the first we have engines also inside of the SOC uh, that allow us uh, DMA transactions. So malicious programs, if the, if the platform is not properly configured, uh, malicious entities will take over these, these engines and still and start to master uh, DMA transactions, right? Uh, with all the uh, <clears throat> possible consequences that were uh, aforementioned. And also we have this variety of cards that we have out there. They, uh, they now they come with an adaptable uh, firmware they what they uh, increase the attack surface. Even when you uh, trust on the cards that are uh, installed in your computer, this you are not always uh, uh, aware, or you are not always responsible for the for the quality of this of this firmware. If this if this firmware has secure boot, or if this firmware is free of all vulnerabilities, right? So this is an an extra attack surface that we need to consider when we are talking about uh, this 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 uh, this kind of possible vulnerabilities. And uh, next. Oh. Excellent. So now we're going to talk about uh, some of the DMA security researcher research that's out there, and there is a lot. Oh. Starting with uh, subverting Win Seven kernel with a DMA attacks. That was the first ever uh, PCI-based attack through a custom PCI device with a DMA engine. Then we had Thunderbolt in 2013 that explored DMA attacks on 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 Thunderbolt, and we had Inception. An open source tool that presented a virtual serial bus or SBP2 interface to perform DMA attacks over Firewire, Express Card, and any other Thunderbolt and any other PCI or PCIe hardware interface. After that, we had uh, Joe Fitz presenting the Slot Screamer, part of the NSA playset that used a USB 3380 board as a DMA hardware implant. 
And it's also an open source tool to access memory and IO and perform DMA attacks. More recently, now we have the PCI Leech, which uses a, a variety of FPGAs with the PCIe uh, physical interface, whether it's an M.2 card, an Express card, mini PCIe, and has a remarkable DMA attack suite demised to dump keys or dump UEFI memory regions or patch windows, lock screens, et cetera. Ulf does an amazing job. And I think it's become kind of the de facto industry tool that um, hackers can use kind of off the shelf to perform DMA attacks. Uh, then we had the HPE ILO uh, research, which was groundbreaking research that uh, uses PCIe leech integration to send malicious commands um, BMC commands to the host. And we have Thunderclap, which tricks the user into authorizing malicious uh, PCI devices. Pico DMA that uses a smaller wireless DMA implant that uses the Pico EVV board that's an M.2 factor attached that, that attaches a radio to it so you can have remote access to it. And there was Thunderspy uh, presented at Black Hat USA in 2020 that, that's a suite of, of Thunderbolt 3 vulnerabilities. And I really did a disservice here by not including 2021's uh, Black Hat USA presentation by Intel's Harish Gatri. If you can go check out his talk, he can go into a lot more detail that we can in just a th 30 minute webinar. Uh, and he talks uh, about more uh, DMA vulnerabilities that he found and, and patched and, and, and kind of uh, the landscape as well. So as you can see, there is 20 years worth of research and tools that hackers have been working on um, in exploring some of these types of attacks and all the different uh, formats and, and creating tools so that we can uh, re reproduce them and, and address them. And as, as a response, uh, we, the, the PCI protocol has has evolved as well. It's uh, it, we we believe, or Intel has stood behind its protocol. We believe that it's efficient, it's useful, and we just you know uh, the threat landscape changes over the last thirty years. So we have uh, expanded it and evolved security features to protect against some of these attacks along with it. And one of the main ones that that I'll be talking to you about is VTD. It's Intel Virtualization Technology for Directed I.O., which is an I.O. MMU or an I.O. memory management unit, and it's designed to support I.O. virtualization. You could go check out the, the white paper uh, for, called U Using I.O. MMU for DMA Protection in UEFI Firmware. Um, in a nutshell, what it is is that a device that's connected, a PCIe device that's connected to a platform cannot read or write to memory that has not been explicitly allocated or mapped for it. So um, this was introduced back in 2006. It's a feature that provides IO virtualization and enables DMA remapping. And the UEFI system firmware is responsible for detecting and remapping the hardware functions in the platform and reporting the remapped hardware units to the system software through the DMA remapping reporting or DMAR ACPI tables. And then the engine is responsible for remapping the transactions and enables the hypervisor to page walk between virtualized and the physical addresses. And then we have another security feature that Kwa will talk to you about. Yes, uh, as Maggie mentioned it, we are we have uh, VTD. Well, the Intel Intel servers uh, Intel servers Intel CPUs implement uh, this uh, the virtualization device feature. That is a way of IMMU uh, input output uh, memory management unit that allows us to 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 remap memory. So there's one extension. Uh, that is uh, also, well, the, the PCI devices, they are also doing their part, uh, trying to uh, provide uh, support and escalation for the, for, the PCI, for the PCI protocol and the, P and the PCI devices, uh, but at the same time, uh, keeping the, the, system, the, the system secure, right? One of those uh, the features that help us with that is the SROIOV. The single root uh, input output virtualization. Uh, as mentioned in the past, uh, well, we will have a multiple, we, we will expect to have multiple PCI devices in one, uh, in, in one platform, right? And all of them will be demanding resources. 
Uh, and I mean, especially when we are talking, let's just say that uh, servers or a very, uh, very uh, servers uh, in a server environment, a cloud environment where you have virtual machines and those virtual machines require a, required a devices to be assigned to. Uh, in the past with regular VTD, for instance, you need a physical device to be assigned directly to the, to the virtual machine. And then you lose the capability to assign this, those, that device to other virtual machine without the risk of those uh, domain, domains to being, uh, uh, how to say, to, to be, to those domains to be broken between, uh, between the, those uh, two different between the virtual machines, right? However, now with the, with the SROV, well, the, the main idea is that there, it is just one single PCI device, but inside of, the, of this, it has uh, multiple replied uh, hardware that this one allows you to have what is uh, virtual functions that are equivalent, equivalent to virtual devices. And these virtual devices, you are able to assign uh, directly to the, to, the, to the guest virtual machines in your, in your main host, right? This allows you all these tricks to these virtual machines to believe that they own uh, their own physical device and being able to manage this, uh, this device as, as, um, as, 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 they, as they would like uh, without the intervention of any other virtual machine. And also this frees the, the hypervisor for the task to being uh, selecting or uh, uh, classifying all the traffic that is coming for 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 different virtual machines for virtual devices, right? All the traffic, uh, uh, the, the the hypervisor, the only thing that needs to do that that needs to do, is to configure all these virtual devices using uh, Intel VTD, uh, being assigned to the virtual machines, and then all the all the traffic will go directly to the to the to to the real physical device, what is mastered by a physical function, and then internally. All the traffic will be classified, selected, and attended uh, for the specific uh, for the specific virtual device without the intervention of any additional software from the host. Uh, this all this classification could be done through firmware in the device, or in uh, or even by actual hardware, uh, actual replied hardware that uh, that is implemented, increasing the isolation between the devices and providing a next level of scalability. Uh, uh, but also providing an scalability and security at, uh, at, this, at the same time, right? Um, so as this, this, as this, this, this example is focused in an Ethernet, uh, in, a, in an Ethernet, uh, in an Ethernet card, but it can be used for F by FPGAs or for uh, intelligent, uh, artificial intelligent uh, acceleration cards or any kind of devices that they want to have a virtualized, uh, that, that they want to work in virtualized environment uh, or when you want to have a scalability with the, with the process that you want to provide in your platform. Thanks. Perfect. So we have these security features and uh, part of what's interesting is that as um, we've grown and created these features, the attack surface has become a little bit more complex as well, because it's not as simple as, sometimes it's not as simple as just turning on a feature and that's it. So we wanted to talk a little bit about what these features do, some of their challenges and, and some of our recommendations so that you can get the most out of these features. So with VTD specifically, it provides hardware memory isolation and hardware memory remapping, which is great because our cards can only talk or whatever you plug into your PCI ports can only talk to the memory that was specifically assigned in the DMR table. However, um, so we have to rely on the hypervisor programming to, to, to do this correctly. Um, the, the memory re regions and the DMR tables have to be very well defined. So you have to know exactly um, and, and, and so we really recommend, and I'm maybe jumping to, to the best practices already, but um, it, like not, don't just flip on VTD. Make sure to go read your DMR tables and make sure that the devices have access to the memory ranges that you expect them to have access to. And VTD doesn't guarantee isolation between devices that share an external PCI bridge. So if you have 
multiple devices connected to the same PCI bridge, you have to make sure that those devices share the same permission level or that it's okay for them to, to be connected together because they will not be isolated or separated in the way that one might expect with, with VTD. So yes, our best practice is to ensure that the protection is always enabled. Um, you really, you know, uh, the, I, I, there's not a, a downside to, to having VTD on. So turn on VTD, um, ensure that um, all devices connected to a single PCI bridge have the same trust level, review your DMAR tables. And another recommendation is probably that what we have VTD for pre-boot and for runtime. So make sure that you have both of them on. Uh, that, that, that's um, probably ideal to make sure that uh, pre-boot and runtime you are protected and your PCI devices are um, um, having access to only what, what you want them to have access to. I believe Intel vPro has uh, two separate UEFI um, uh, variables to go check for these uh, features. And as far as SRIOV considerations, the benefit is that we have hardware device virtualization, which is awesome. Um, it provides a scalability of our hardware where every VM can just um, transparently see the hardware and use it as if it was its own. It uh, reduces the required configuration by the hypervisor and the, the PCIe expansion requirements. Some of the challenges is that it is expensive technology. Um, the, the management firmware increases in complexity. So that's, that, that, that's sometimes a trade-off that happens and virtualization issues are, are harder to patch. So our best practices here are to always update to the latest firmware and driver version that, that you have. Always, always update and rely on hardware roots of trust such as PFR or the platform firmware resiliency features that aids in detecting and recovering from potential firmware corruption. Now, several, uh, <clears throat> as, as Maggie was mentioning, some of the, some of the challenges for, uh, for SROV uh, is that you move, basically you move your trust from your hypervisor to the device that is making now the, 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 the device and its firmware that is doing now the, the virtualization, right? So you need to be always aware of what is being running and know if you can trust on this external device that is being executed. So uh, integrate these uh, these devices into the in the into the in the into the into the trust boundary of the platform has been challenging uh, for for uh, uh, science, science of time now. So there's always there's new ways that they want to that, that we want to uh, <clears throat> implement new ways that we want to find to integrate and to have an uh, an order than uh, a solid TCB in the platform in order to trust the components that we incorporate on it. Right, as was mentioned, TFR is one of them. Uh, but another uh, one, one, uh, one other upcoming technology that allows that allows that is the is the security protocol and data model, the SPDM protocol that is uh, that that is, is is developed by the MTF, and basically this is a specification uh, that defines the data and objects uh, that are being interchanged between the host and the PCI and the PCI or the external device in order to build a uh, root of trust and a security path among them uh, to consolidate uh, to consolidate the communication and also make attestation that the, the external device that is connected into the platform is actually the one that the host expects and then start trust on it when it is start to doing uh, virtualization or relying on the component for critical transactions. So this is, uh, this is, this is still by in developing and you can check uh, more uh, uh, more details about it in the DMTF in the DMTF uh, side. Uh, on the other side, we have what is the compute the Compute Express Link uh, that is the, developed by the Compute Express Link Group, the CXL Group. It's an it's an upcoming uh, technology that is uh, uh, that is developed is being developed by big uh, by, by by big players in the game. Uh, that that is an is. It's not an ex, it's not an evolution of PCI itself. It's more like an aside extension 
where it takes advantage of the of the protocol to to provide uh, this the it, it takes advantage of the protocol to to provide the same capability of data transfer but also ex expands the semantic that the has the that the original pci had uh, to be able to provide uh, more complex features those semantics are when you are the caching protocol where you are able to perform cacheable transactions and increase the performance uh, of the workloads that you have inside that 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 you have in your in your platform this is known and this is known as cxl.cache and also you can extend to a cxl memory semantic memory access semantic when you can use uh, the memory of the cxl device uh, as an extension of the of your actual system memory in order to increase the, the 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 communication bandwidth between the device and the, the between the device and the host, reducing dramatically uh, the, the 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 charge or, or the overhead in the uh, in the system and increasing the increasing the speed and the efficiency. Excellent. So hopefully the takeaways is that. Um, you know, PCI has been around for a long time, for over 30 years. We've had 20 years of security research and tools that are available. Uh, with, with the years and the research, we've evolved, expanded, and created security features such as VTD and SRIOV that help protect against these attacks. Uh, proper understanding and configuration of the security features is very important to get the protection that they're meant or designed to provide. And there are some upcoming technology that will also help evolve and address some of these challenges. So I believe we can now move to our Q&A. Thank you very much, Maggie and Kuo, for the presentation. Um, we received a few questions, but I would encourage everyone to share their questions if they have any uh, in the chat box so that we can answer them now. Um, the first question that we got is uh, who programs these virtual functions? It has to be the hypervisor is uh, mostly uh, the hypervisor is the hypervisor, the hypervisor is the one who assigned the virtual functions to the to the to the virtual machines using uh, uh, using the and it also has to pro to program the the VTD tables in order to uh, redirect. The the, the, tra the 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 traffic that is coming to to fr from the device to sorry not from the device uh, from the from the virtual machine uh, to the virtual function in the device but when the virtual function the virtual function is assigned to a virtual to a virtual machine is like the virtual machine has access to a direct physical uh, to, a, to a direct physical device thank you um, another question was using DMA via PCI, is it possible to halt the computer and acquire, so to say, an atomic dump of the memory? Uh, this question also got an answer in the chat box, but it would be nice if you would answer it as well so that you can we can see your perspective on it. Uh, yes, actually, you you can use the the one of the uses of the of one of the, the of the tools that were mentioned by Maggie is not only for attacking but it's also for forensics. Uh, you can you can retrieve uh, the you can retrieve data even when the the system is if the system is alive the system is when the system is alive or when the system is halt you can retrieve all this data without the 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 awareness of the of the of the main CPU, and even when the system, let's just say that it moved to a corrupted state and this and the and is not is not working anymore, you can use DMA to dump the memory and see what was going on during the execution. It's one of the possible uses. Yes. Thank you. Um, are there any more questions? Let's wait a little bit. If uh, anyone has any more questions, please uh, share them in the chat box? While we wait, maybe I'll just say that um, I, I forgot to mention, there's always the Intel bug bounty. So part of our security pledge is um, come come hack us, right? We, we, we have, uh, if you can find security vulnerabilities in our features or our, our protocols, 
uh, depending on, on the criticality, you can uh, you can get you can get a good reward, and, and we we want to work with you. So you're always invited to come join the Intel Bug Bounty. All right, I don't think there are any more questions. Um, so in that case, uh, thank you again for answering the questions and for delivering this presentation. Uh, it was a pleasure to have you with us today. Um, guys, please don't forget to fill in the feedback form, uh, which I shared earlier in the chat box and which will also pop up after the uh, Zoom meeting is over. Uh, and it would be really nice if you would give a shout out to Maggie and Poao on social media. Um, so this concludes the webinar. Thank you all for attending and hope to see you next week with another Hardware I.O. webinar. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a nice Bye. day. Bye.